Um, hi, I'm Laura. Um, I am a developer evangelist, developer advocate at Rackspace, and I'm also the director of our startup incubator back in San Francisco. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit today. It's a very informal talk. It's more just kind of our experiences going through the I Look Like an Engineer movement. Raise your hand if you're familiar with the I Look Like an Engineer hashtag. Okay, a good chunk of the room. Um, and I'm reachable on Twitter at Pinky Swearing. It's really the only like social media that I use. So uh, a little bit about me. I am a Hackbright alumna, and Hackbright is a software engineering fellowship only for women. And there are about almost 300 of us now. Um, and we have an alumni group called Lady Nerds. And together we are close to 300 women not beginning, but sort of mid and advanced level engineering careers. And we found that there are a ton of resources for women who want to break into engineering and fixing sort of that pipeline issue. But how do we sustain ourselves once we're in these jobs, once we're encountering a lot of obstacles? So we've banded together um, as a very, very strong, very diverse group. And a friend of ours, um, Isis Anchali, who works at One Login, had put up, uh, her company had put up ads all through San Francisco on public transit. So she had a picture of herself saying, my company is so great and I love working here. And she had not even thought about it. It was just kind of your basic general recruiting and blanket marketing. However, within like 72 hours, she got the most heinous emails you could imagine that were very sexually explicit, others that were just straight date offers and things like that, which was especially odd considering she had no social presence whatsoever. She had a poorly fleshed out LinkedIn, no Twitter, no Facebook, nothing like that. So solely from her face and the company that she worked for, people were aggressive enough that they were able to find out her name and her Gmail address, and then go the third step to send her a bunch of solicitations. So that was shared with us in the Lady Nerds group as more of just like a venting community thing, but we pushed with we should do something in response. So Michelle Glauser is the other person who's the primary leader of this campaign, and I would be the third. I'm definitely a worker and not a speaker, so... Um, probably the quietest one of the three. And we decided to move forward with with all of this. So Isis tweeted out the first picture of herself um, just kind of affirming that she does her job. And along with the sort of explicit email she got, she also got many that was like, we don't look like an engineer. Or even more that thought it was a stock photo where they had just chosen like picture of generic woman and then put the generic marketing text next to it. Uh, none of those were true. And when we shared that as a community, overwhelmingly, everybody said, I know, I've experienced that as well. So we knew it was a very shared experience. And so with that, we knew we decided to move forward. So that happened super quickly. Like within six hours, we went from one post to 50,000, 60,000 posts. And at first we were like, oh, we're viral, woo, oh yeah. Which quickly turned to, oh shit. Uh, raise your hand if you've ever become viral in your own, like whatever your metric is for it, on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, anything like that. Yeah. So you post one thing. Uh, raise your hand if you censor yourself on social media because you worry about the impact of that. Right, so even if you haven't experienced it, you proactively plan for it because you anticipate it as a thing, which is terrible, but very true. So we had this huge social response that was growing very, very quickly. Most of it was positive. Other women from around the world started posting pictures of themselves. And not just software engineers, people who do aeronautical engineering, biomedical engineering, genetic research, data science, engineers from all across every walk of STEM fields. Um, and so we started trying to track all of the responses, which became really difficult because the Twitter API is bad and like scraping social data from Reddit and Facebook is really bad. And then scraping it from so international social media was even harder for us, even though we knew that the hashtag was blowing up internationally. Um, but in some, my slides are really small, so I'm going to reference these up here. Uh, yeah, we've crossed the half a million mark on tweets, and then we're also doing uh, really strong on the news stories. So that was the second phase, where once news outlets started calling all of us, um, asking us, what, what is this all for? What is your statement to the press? Can you talk to CNN? Can you talk to MSNBC? Can you talk to NPR? We were just like three lady engineers who tweeted a picture that same day. So we didn't really have a response prepared. Like, well, can we talk to your PR team? Yeah, we super don't have that either. Um, 
But what we did have was full-time jobs, and I have two full-time jobs at Rackspace, and so does Isis, and uh, so does Michelle. So we started doing this in our spare time, um, and our jobs were all gracious enough to kind of give us the time to make this our, our full-time job for about a month as we managed this campaign to decide what is the message, which was what everyone was asking. Now that you have all of this traction and all of this momentum, what do you really mean and what are you gonna do with it? And that turned out to be a very difficult question. What was the message? Was it about feminism? Was it about education? Was it about racism? Was it about sexism? Was it about awareness? Was it about education? Like, there were so many different ways that other outlets had interpreted it for us, we had not really thought about what that message would be moving forward. And we read a lot of social media, um, at some point, we were thinking about responding to all of them, but then we realized like that is a terrible thing. There was a lot of noise around it, which seems to be like the catalyst for trolls. Whenever they hear it, that's like, oh, our song, and they, you know, all come out. So we knew we knew we had to like not respond, but we also wanted to be very inclusive. And the inclusive part of it ended up being a double-edged sword, where within our own alumni group. We're a very strong, very educated community. Some very formally at the top Ivy Leagues, others completely self-educated, both from like a interpersonal and sociological and also in an engineering spectrum of self-education. And how could we please all of those different demographics? Feminists who are hardline feminists in our group felt that including men in the campaign or in the ads was a rejection of women and their values. We had other people who felt we should prioritize people of color and we should restrict involvements from corporations. If we took any corporate money, were we selling out? And so it became very, very difficult for us to make an inclusive message that was also not dismissive of the opinions, some of them very, very well formed and articulate of our peers. And in the end, we decided it's up to you, that you deserve respect, and that's something that everybody can agree on. And not just agree on and like, a, we all agree, but really believe in type of thing. And in the end, we decided that our message moving forward and in that moment was that if you do engineering, any kind, any place, if you code, if you're a programmer, if you do a little bit of HTML, CSS, if you do engineering for oil rigs out in Dallas, you are an engineer. And you are already what an engineer should look like and does look like. That was it. And that was our umbrella statement. So we let people kind of move forward with that. And we were very happy that that resonated with everyone. We also felt like that was kind of the message of the hashtag to begin with. So to be able to verbalize that in like a one-liner that we could tell to CNN and NBC and NPR was very helpful for us. And also we wanted to recognize that, you know, at first we thought maybe this was too simplistic, but that saying this was very empowering for a lot of people and also an implicit way of saying, and I don't feel it. I don't feel respected. I don't feel like other people see me as an engineer. I don't feel like other people see me as being educated and proficient in my career. So purely by taking part of this, we knew that people were saying they understood the shared experience and that they had this implicit understanding um, of that experience spectrum. So the other thing was that awareness ended up being our movement moving forward. However, it was all we kind of could do in a three to four week timeline. And some people had been very critical about us um, with that, with you have all this attention, what did you do with it? Well, we were three people with full-time jobs who were doing this in like the two hours on the side that we had. So we feel like we've done pretty good considering. Um, and so what we ended up doing with all of the social media traction is that we wanted to take that off the web. Because even though it was very viral on Twitter, in the general public, the demographic who's using Twitter very heavily enough to be aware of trending hashtags is super small, fractional really, in the larger Bay Area. And especially um, right across the Bay is Oakland, and we knew that by and large, like that message was not hitting that. It was not hitting most commuters in Silicon Valley, so we decided to attack markets that we thought really needed to hear it, not the markets that were already most engaged in these discussions about diversity and technology, because most likely, they already knew. So we started an Indiegogo campaign, and we raised just around $35,000 in a couple of weeks, and that was all completely crowdfunded. 
And then on top of that, we got some corporate donations. And that was a whole nother bag of worms where we hesitated to partner and we had offers from everyone, Google, Twitter, Intel, and they all wanted us to get on board. And can we say like, how can Google look like an engineer? And we'll give you $100,000 to say that we support this. Many people in our alumni group are past Google employees, and if you read any of the stuff that Erica Baker is writing right now about Google and diversity, you know that they don't have the best track record with it. Um, and Erica is in our alumni group, and so we decided to forego the corporate funding and just do it ourselves. So we partnered with my own company, Rackspace, as well as a number of ad companies who were willing to give us free ad space, like Clear Channel and Billups, who did free design for us. Um, we knew the end goal was advertising, so instead of asking tech companies to pay for advertising, we just went straight to the advertisers and asked if we could sort of circumvent that. And so that's what we ended up doing. Uh, and these were our ads that we ran. We partnered with the Kapoor Center for Social Good as well. Um, and Girls Who Code, Black Girls Who Code, the Hack Red Alumni Network, and we also had a giant party, which I'll talk about in a second. And we offered free headshots for people to use on LinkedIn or on their business cards and also for this campaign. We had over 600 headshots, and so all of these ads are randomized, where we just took a randomized selection of everybody who offered to participate, and then they gave a release to be used on these billboards. And so it was. And we put out a lot of ads. Um, we went all through San Francisco, uh, the financial district, the SOMA, which is where almost all of the tech companies you see and many, many gaming companies are. And we blanketed them with billboards and roll down ads and sort of those like kiosk ads that are just standalone ones. We also got on public transit and we actually took back the same ad space that ISIS's ads originally had ran on and then ran our own I look like an engineer ones in those same spaces on BART, which is the Bay Area underground subway system. We also took the ad to Oakland and we ran it in a bunch of targeted areas there, including downtown. Um, and then we decided to put it on giant LED billboards on the Silicon Valley commute. So everybody who came from Google and Mountain View, Facebook and Palo Alto, any of those venture capital firms as they sit, which in San Francisco we have sort of bumper to bumper traffic, it can be a two hour commute. You had to sit and look at our billboards. Uh, and they, they're still running, it's been about six weeks. Um, and as the billboards have been up, it's created this second round of awareness where now people who see that we're doing something with it want to give us even more money to keep the ads running, to refurbish the ads, to take the ads to new markets. And right now we're working on getting them in the Pacific Northwest, in Seattle and Portland, and possibly also New York. And many people responded where they found faces that looked like theirs or their friends or their coworkers or people they went to college or high school with and they tweeted it and that was really cool because people were seeing themselves in the ad, the empowerment that people felt, seeing ISIS do the hashtag they took back for themselves and then they also got this kind of second wave of popularity by participating in it and becoming celebrities in their own right for nothing other than being themselves and being excellent in their careers. And so what did we learn? Uh, we learned that faces make a big difference. Um, and that, I can't see my own slides, but I know this one has minimal text. Yes, uh, faces do make a big difference. And we really wanted to humanize the argument and then repeat that message over and over and over and over. And as simplistic as it was, we knew that this was oftentimes the gateway where my parents knew about diversity in tech and they don't use any tech devices. Um, because they had seen it on the news and because it was so simple to understand. And this was the catalyst for learning more because suddenly you saw people that looked like you or people who were your neighbors or your friends or your same gender or race or age group. Um, and I think for us, we feel like we kind of stumbled into the luckiness of connecting people with all of these resources to help educate them, to help companies train and provide better options to improve diversity in tech within their companies. Can we do all of that ourselves? Hell no, but we can refer people to it, which is what we're doing moving forward. We also decided to build a community around it where we took the community that we had built online and threw a big party and the party sold out. <laughs> so much so that there was like a line wrapped around the block and people thought we were doing like a movie premiere or a free giveaway. Nope. Uh, so <laughs> we were really excited. We invited everyone who participated with a photo and the hashtag to join. 
Um, and we held a big panel, and we had a bunch of speakers, many of whom you might know if you're familiar with any of the diversity and tech dialogues that are going on. However, this time, we said, talk about whatever you want. We're not gonna ask our slides in advance. We're not gonna ask that you censor yourself. Just tell your story, tell your truth. And we were very grateful that people did. And people were very uncensored, and we were very thrilled that that gamble worked out. And then TechCrunch gave us a really nice headline, and so did other media outlets. And so to hear from those media outlets before that were hounding us, what is this all for? What does it mean? Finally, they understood when we brought them in with the community, where they weren't just hearing it from us, the organizers, but they were hearing it from hundreds of people who had experienced that same subtle discrimination, that same undermining of their careers and their personalities. And we also learned that as difficult as it is to kind of do a campaign this large and to sustain this much attention, the people in it will sustain you. And that staying connected to the community that you serve is the easiest way to keep you moving forward. And we are gonna keep moving forward. Um, Michelle, who is the other organizer, this is all of us together in a picture. Uh, Michelle is working on a tour and she is actually working with Ash, who runs AlterConf, uh, to do a tour at universities and also some small conferences around to bring that environment that we created at the event in San Francisco to cities across the United States. And she has received enough funding to do that. Um, so that will be coming, I think, starting in January, and she'll be bringing a tour of all of those, which I very much encourage you to come and participate in. We also have a bunch of swag that's coming out soon. Um, if you will reference our awesome MC for a moment, she has a shirt, which will soon be very familiar to many of you. Uh, the I Look Like an Engineer shirts and socks and stickers just came in and we're having a wrapping party for them next week at Rackspace where we're going to wrap and send out thousands and thousands and thousands of packages that everybody ordered online because again we're three people and we didn't really think about who will package and label and send all these out. <laughs> surprise it's us. Um, and if you ordered something and you're wondering what the delay is, surprise it's us. Um, and we also have a temporary website up. Again, we're three engineers, but we have full-time engineering jobs. So the website is a little sparse right now, but what we've been doing is collecting um, talks and slides and things that have been related and photos, and we're amalgamating it all into the website. And by January, that website will be a resource that when you see the I look like an engineer hashtag or you hear about it, you see it in media, you see it on news, you see it in your social networks, you can go to this website and it'll connect you to any resource you want. Do you want to learn to code? Do you want to find communities that will help you stay in this uh, field, even though you feel excluded or like you want to leave? Do you want to bring diversity speakers to your company or your academic group? Um, do you want to represent by wearing some of our cool stuff? Do you want to get in touch with any of us personally? The website will connect you with all of those things you need to do to bring a little bit more of that community and some of that education back to your community. So that's it. That was our experience. Uh, it's been a really good ride um, and we hope to take it forward. Thank you. <laughs>